Come on, Church by the Glades. Come on, before you sit down, let's give it up for Jesus one time. Put your hands together for King Jesus tonight. Awesome. You may be seated. Man, I, I really want to take like Heather with me just to do like my introduction. Like she is amazing. Want to welcome everybody join us all around the world at Church Online. So glad that you guys are here with us today. Uh, for those of you guys that may be new, my name is Scott Williams. I bring you greetings from the great state of Oklahoma, uh, the city of Oklahoma City. I generally would say home of the 2018 NBA champions, but I don't want to talk about the NBA right now other than anyone but the Warriors. I don't care if LeBron wins another one, whoever, but any Anybody but Golden State. Can I get an amen? Okay, it's good. We got something in common. Uh, we are going to have fun tonight. Just a little bit about me. I'm married. I have one wife. She's awesome. Uh, her name is LaKendria. And we have two sons. Our oldest son, Scott Wesley Williams Jr. He just finished his uh, freshman year in college. And then my youngest son, Jaden Scott Williams, just finished his freshman year in high school. So that's awesome. We got some, I mean, man, it's a, seriously, a kid has finished first year in college. It's crazy. That's, that's really, really different. And so I, I travel a lot. So I go to lots of amazing places. But there's no place that I'd rather come than sunny South Florida. That was a joke. It was a joke. Lies, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's been every time I come, it rains. You know what I'm saying? I bring rain, call me Rain Man anyway. But every time I come here, no, don't call me Rain Man, I'm sorry. But uh, every time I come here, seriously, it rains. But it's great to be here. Let me tell you, I love your church, I love your pastors. Pastor David and Lisa are awesome, they're the real deal. I mean. What you see on stage is the same thing that you see off stage. As a matter of fact, my entire family went to work out with Pastor David. We had a great time. He goes like this old school, really cool gym. It's got like equipment I've never even seen before. So we worked out with him and been hanging out with the family, been doing dinner. I mean, I just love the family, all the kids. I mean, nephew Charlie actually graduated from high school this week. So let's give it up. Man, give a round of applause to all the high school and college graduates. Give them a round of applause. College graduates, yes, yes, yes. You can finally go pay some bills. <laughs> pay some bills. Life is going to be different. And so I travel a lot, which means that I'm always at, like, different churches and different places all around the country. And so and in Oklahoma City, when, when you're flying and traveling, one thing that's unique is that we don't have lots of direct flights. So anytime I'm going anywhere, I have to make a connection. Generally, it's through Atlanta or maybe through Salt Lake City. And so I'm always making a connection on a flight. And so the, the thing is that's, that's kind of cool and all, but a brother has to get up really, really early. And so, like, to catch, like, a 6 o'clock flight, I got to get to the airport, like, at 4-something in the morning. And so I have one or two options. I either, A, I'll drive and, like, do the parking, but that takes too much time, or I'll have my wife drive me and drop me off, but I feel a little bad because it's so early in the morning. And then the other option, which is great in some cities, but not so much in Oklahoma City because we don't have very many options, that's catch an Uber. And so sometimes the flight is really early, I'll just grab an Uber, but in Oklahoma City, it can take you a long time to get an Uber. Remember one time I was probably about... I don't know, maybe a month ago, I'm, I'm requesting an Uber early in the morning, get there for something in the morning, catch my flight. And then on the way back, I was coming back, and um, they said that we were going to have a delay. So my wife told me, call, hey, call, let me know if you need me to pick you up or if you're going to be able to, you know, catch Uber, how you're going to get home or whatever. So I was like, cool. So we stopped in our layover, and it's like, you know what, we're probably not going to get home till around midnight. Around midnight, so I said, I told my wife, like, hey, babe, I'm probably not going to get home to around midnight, but when I land, I will let you know. Because, again, Oklahoma City, there's a good chance there might not be an Uber available, right? And so we, we landed in Oklahoma City. Flight was delayed. I landed around 11.45, almost midnight. And as soon as I land, like, my trick is I go ahead and call the Uber right then because it can be anywhere from 10 minutes to 25 minutes before you actually get an Uber, especially if it's really late. You know what I'm saying? So, I actually, I, I landed. I called and requested the Uber. And then I called my wife, and I was, like, uh, I was like, hey, babe, I don't need a ride. I already got a ride. She's like, Scott, how are you getting home? I was like, don't worry about it. Jesus is bringing me home. She's like, Scott, it's midnight. I don't have time to play games. How are you getting home? I said, for real, Jesus is picking a brother up. And, um, <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I can't make this thing up. And so that, that was the Uber that I requested, and it just said that Jesus was picking a brother up. So I didn't know quite how I felt about this, about midnight getting picked up by Jesus. But then... I started thinking about, like, this can't be the real King Jesus because he got a 4.8. Jesus would have had five stars. You know what I'm saying? Like, five stars. And that's some Pharisees are hating on him. I'm going to give him a two. I'm going to give him a two. That whole water. The water. Anyway, so, like, uh, like, so, like, literally, so I'm requesting. Then I started thinking, like, man, it's probably not Jesus because guess what? Like, he's driving a Toyota 4Runner. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we know what kind. You know, Jesus would have been, been driving a Honda, right? 
Because all the disciples were on one accord. <laughs> Sorry, bad preacher joke. But uh, um, so, uh, but then they saw that true story. So, like, I go and I get my bag and I'm getting ready to go and then go out there to meet Jesus, right? I'm excited about this moment. And so, I get my bag behind me. I go out there to the forerunner and go open the door. I said, I said, hey, are, are you Jesus? He's like, oh, no, Jesus, Jesus. So, oh, so, so it's good. Nonetheless, like, put a brother's bag in the car. And, like, and here's the deal. Like, I've caught Ubers, like, all around the world. South Africa, Australia, I've caught Ubers, like, everywhere. And so, but the crazy thing was, like, when I'm catching this Uber, like, I've never seen an Uber like this. Like, I get in the car, and he's got, like, like lights, like, rope lights around the bottom, and they're, like, flashing all around the edge. So, these rope lights, and if you look at the top, he had rope lights that were there that were flashing as well, and and if you look in the middle, he had, like, this big basket of, like, snacks and, like, water and, and mints and candy and, and just all kind of, I mean, Dasani. It was just going on all in the middle. And then there was, like, a tip jar, but, but it was a tip jar that I've never seen before. Like, you could put some money in the tip jar, but if you tried to go too far and you put your hand in, your, your hand would get stuck. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you can put something in, but don't try to take nothing out, Right? And so I'm sitting there, I'm with Jesus, I'm seeing his tip jar, we got the lights, and the brother's rolling home. And I live in the suburbs, so it's about a 20-minute ride from the airport. And so we're on our way home, and so we're, we're going, and, and I remember we're probably, I don't know, maybe eight minutes from my house. And he had already turned off the lights, and we're having a conversation about, you know, he works with AAA doing insurance stuff in the morning, and he drives Uber in the evening to, to help take care of his family. So really, really cool guy. And, and so as we're driving, and so all of a sudden he turned the lights back on. Or at least that's what I thought. I thought maybe like once you got close to the destination, he turned the lights on to let you know, like get your bag ready and all that. And so I saw these flashing lights, but I looked down, I was like, man, I don't see the lights here. It's like, oh no, there's some lights behind us. And so, like, oh no, we getting pulled over. I'm like, oh Lord. And real quick, by a show of hands, those of you guys online, those of you in this room, how many of you guys have ever been pulled over in an Uber? That's right, nobody but just me, right? You know what I'm saying? So this is just me and Jesus at midnight getting pulled over. And right, I'm thinking, man, this ain't good. You got a brown brother in the front. You got a black brother in the back. We got candy and lights. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing that's good that's going to come out of this situation. We go, the officer comes up to the window. Excuse me, sir, can I uh, have your license and insurance? He's like, oh, sorry, no hablo inglés. I'm like, what? You've been speaking English the whole time. I, hey, officer, he lying, man. He tripping. I, man, you better quit tripping. This is midnight. Hands up, don't shoot, man. We got brown and black brothers. This is not going to be good. You tripping, dog. You better let him know that you speak English. And then I immediately start saying, hey, officer, like, seriously, like, man, this is, he's a great man of God. He, he's a real, I mean, I've been talking to him. He just, he drives Uber at, at night just to take care of his family. He's got a full-time job. Like, I really think that he doesn't deserve a ticket. I really think you need to show him favor. He was just, you say 15 miles an hour over? He was just going 15 miles an hour over. Like, he's just trying to get me home. I really think you should show him some favor. You should take care of him. And the officer kind of had this disturbed look. He looked like, like, I don't even know what's going on here. But um, he's like, you know, I never do this. You know, late at night, you generally have people that, you know, are coming home from clubs and they're drinking or whatever. He's like, I never write a warning. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a warning. He said, you know what? Even, I'm not even going to run your license and insurance. You guys have a great rest of your night. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus, right? And so then I, and then I, I, I he rolls his window up. I was like, hey, Zeus. I said, do you know Jesus? He's like, Yes, I know Jesus. I said, because if you don't know Jesus, we're about to lead you to the Lord right now. Because I don't know if you know what just happened, but you got a brown brother and a black brother. And the fact that you didn't get a ticket and I didn't go to jail, that means the favor of God is on your life. And so you need to understand what it means to walk in the favor of God. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about how we can walk in the favor of God. As we continue along in this series, This Is Us, and I, I know there's an alternative name, and I, I'm just going to say what the alternative name is just because I, I want to be able to say this in church, and this is, uh, I, I didn't come up with it, but this is just what I saw on this card. It's called uh, Bays, Besties, and uh, Booty Calls. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to say <laughs> booty call to the 6, six o'clock service, uh, 6.30, whatever time this service is. I wanted to say that in church. But, um, but nonetheless, I want to look at a very familiar story in Scripture. 
But one thing that's familiar about the story is the story of Jesus being born. But ever since we were really young kids, we've been taught this story from a, from a simple context that you had this baby Jesus and, and the parents are there and they're getting ready to give birth, right? And they're trying to go find a hotel. Like every Marriott is booked up. They're like, man, they don't know what's going on. They can't find a hotel anywhere. And so then they go, and he's born in this dusty manger. And so you had the king of kings that's born in this, this weird situation. He's the king of kings, but born in a dusty manger. But what I want to do is I don't want to look at the part where he's born in a manger. I want to look at the process that it took in order to get there. There's a few verses ahead of that that I think we really need to look at to be able to understand what God wants to speak to us through this passage and through this section of Scripture. And so I'm going to go ahead and set the stage for the players that we're going to look at, the key characters in the Scripture. Again, it's Luke 1, around verse 26 through 38. And so what you think about, like, one of the main characters was Mary, and, and scholars say that Mary was between 14 and 16 years old at the time that we're looking at in Scripture. So she's just, say, around 16. And, and, and so the thing is, like, so she's from this really small town called Nazareth. And she was engaged to be married to Joseph, and Joseph was around 30 years old. And I know some of, them, some of my folks in the back of the room are saying, you know what, man, what was Joseph doing robbing the cradle? But, but you got to understand, during this time in Scripture, that was just the sign, the sign of the times. That's how the relationships were. And so you guys track me. You this, this younger couple that were from this really, really small town called Nazareth. Everybody say small town. You can do better than that. Everybody say small town. So you had this young couple from a small town. And then, and then, but you got to understand, they were engaged to be married, but in biblical times, this time we're looking at now, that engagement was very similar to a marriage. And in order for that engagement to end, you actually had to have a divorce. So this engagement was serious business. It's not just something that you play with. So they were engaged to be married. Big deal. And so Mary had an older cousin named Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was from Jerusalem. She was older, and, and her husband, Zechariah, and it was said that she couldn't have kids. She was barren. And they were from this big city, Jerusalem. Everybody say big city. Big city. So you had this young couple that was from a small town, and then you had this older couple that was from a big city. And the reason why that's important is, oh, I want you to understand, it doesn't matter who you are in here today, this message from you is for you. It's because it doesn't matter if you're from a small town that God wants to speak something to you. It doesn't matter if you're a young couple. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're married or if you're engaged. And it doesn't matter if you're an older couple. It doesn't matter if God has said that there's some things in your life that you can't do or some things that can't happen in your relationship. It doesn't matter if you're from a big city. God wants to speak something to every single one of you. And the other character that we're looking at is Gabriel. And Gabriel was the angel that God would send when he had a word. And Gabriel's only mentioned a handful of times in Scripture. And what's important about that, when Gabriel shows up, he normally spooks people. He normally like shows like, what's up? And then they're like, oh, what's going on? And, and he goes on to tell them like, these crazy things like, hey, you know, you're going to have a kid. His name's going to be Jesus. He's going to be son of the most high. Or, hey, you're going to have a, I know you said you're barren, but you're going to have a son. And, you know, he's going to be John the Baptist. And so he shows up with these crazy words. And if you look at Gabriel's name, it literally means the man of God and the strength of God. So today I stand here in front of you as, as the man of God and in the strength of God preaching God's word. And so, that, again, the, the series we're in is um, This Is Us. And the title of today's message is Walk in the Fog. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn around to your neighbor right now and say, Walk in the Fog. I want you to turn around to your other neighbor, the one that was your second choice, your second choice, and say, Walk in the Fog. And for those of you guys that are married or dating and you turned around to someone other than your spouse or the person you're dating, we got marriage counseling available at the end of the service. I'm just saying, um, we're talking about Walk in the Fog, we're talking about walking in the favor of God. And so tonight when you walk out, you're going to walk out with a different perspective of what God would speak to you in your relationships, what God would speak to you in your interactions with people, what God would speak to you about your destiny and what he has in front of you. So what we're going to do is we're going to read verse 26 through 38 in its entirety. Then we'll come back and we'll unpack it a few verses at a time. Here's what the scripture says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. 
Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has, been, uh, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So as we're talking about walking in the fog, again, we're talking about walking in the favor of God. And we're going to look at three keys, three things you need to do if you want to walk in the favor of God. And the first thing, if you're taking notes, I just got three points. The first thing if you're taking notes is this, is you need to focus your eyes. Everybody say focus. focus. You can do better than that. Everybody say focus. focus. Verse 26 through 28, here's what the text says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. So he comes and says, Greeting, favored one. Greeting, hey, you, you that are favored, greetings. Greetings, favored one. So we're talking about Focusing your eyes, we're talking about focusing your eyes on the things of Jesus. We're talking about focusing your eyes on God. And the reason why you don't experience the full favor and blessing of God is because you don't find yourself in a position where you're focusing your eyes on God. It's almost like, have you ever, how many of you guys have been, you know, either you or your family member has been in the hunt for a new car in the last, I don't know, five years or so? New car, new car, okay, many of you, or, or maybe you've been buying a, a, a handbag, ladies, or, or a ha haircut that you're getting, or, or some clothing item, and when you get it, like, you're excited about it, you think you're the only one that has it, and then you either get it or you start looking for it, next thing you know, you see that same car at every single stoplight. That car is everywhere. Next thing you know, you see girls you don't even like with the exact same haircut that you just got. And then and that's what happens. And it's not like those clothing items or those cars just start dropping out the sky. What happens is you begin to focus your eyes. In other words, you begin to pay attention to it. So when we're talking about focusing our eyes on God, we're talking about paying attention to the favor of God that's all around you. Many of you, the reason why you're not seeing is because you're not focusing your eyes. And one of the things I try to do every single morning to make sure that I'm focusing my eyes and that I'm positioning myself to make sure that I'm looking at God in the right place, in the right position, in the right posture. Every morning I wake up, I simply say, thank you, Jesus. Show me your favor today. Thank you, Jesus. Show me your favor today. Because when you start to, to say thank you, you're thanking God in advance for what he's going to do. And when you say, show me your favor today, that means like, God, I want to be able to see it. And when we ask God to see it, next thing you know, it starts popping up just like those cars, and we see it everywhere. I remember it was on February 17th of this year, I posted a simple Instagram post that simply said that. It just simply said, thank you, Jesus. And so I post not, nothing major, nothing crazy, just in this position of, God, I just want to thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. And, and I remember that same day, a little bit later on that afternoon, that morning, my wife and I were headed to my son's wrestling tournament in a town that was about an hour and 45 minutes from us. And so as we're headed to the wrestling tournament, we're on the, the turnpike, and the speed limit was 75, so we're going this way at about 75 miles an hour. 
And as we're going this way about 75 miles an hour, we saw a car on the other side of the median that was coming towards us, and it looked like it had to be going at the pace of the other cars probably 95 miles an hour. It was rolling. So we're going 75. They're coming at us about 95. And then as we're driving, we start to see that same car that's going really, really fast start to come into the median. And as we're continuing to drive, we see them start to come in the median. Next thing you know, they come into the median. They hit the cable barrier. And then next thing you know, the car flips into the air. And for any of you that have ever been in a wreck before, you know what happens kind of like the Matrix. It's really, really fast and in slow motion all at the same time. So we saw this car like flipping in the air. And I'm thinking, God, is this how it's going to end? And then next thing you know, we see that the cable barrier that was there, this car took out about four of those poles. And we see those poles flying in the air. And then one of them, boom, hits into the front of our car. Then one of them, boom, into the hood in front of me. And then one, boom, into the, the roof corner by on the side where my wife was sitting. Then another one, boom, into the side of my vehicle. And so I'm afraid finally we got, I got out the car and I, and I pull over and I try to go find the guy who was, because his car was flipped into the median. And I go airbags deployed. And I'm looking in the car and, and he wasn't there. And then next thing you know, I look and I see him. He's over across the street talking to another guy. And I go talk to him like, hey, bro, you know, you, you hit some stuff that, that hit my car. Are you okay? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Brother was smoking a cigarette. Looked like he was just stressed out. And so, you know what I'm saying? Like he's just sitting there. And, and then so we, we leave and, and we, we go. And as we're, we, obviously there, our car was towed. We couldn't go to the wrestling tournament. But it's at that moment that I realized that, that I had just somebody shared, like they saw me sharing the accident on, on Periscope. Like, do you realize you just posted this post earlier? on Instagram that simply said, thank you, Jesus. And that moment is just a reminder that it's something about finding yourself in this position where you just simply say thank you. And it doesn't mean that things are not going to come at you. It doesn't mean that the projectiles of life are not going to come at your marriage. It doesn't mean that the projectiles of life are not going to come in your situation and there's going to be loss and there's going to be wreck and there's going to be devastation. But what it does mean that if you find yourself in this position where you're willing to say, you know what, thank you, Jesus, in advance, and you find yourself in this position where you say, you know what, show me your favor today. And that's what couples need to do. I mean, many of you are married, and if you would just start your day like that, thanking God for what he's doing in your marriage. But do you know the statistics for couples that get married? What percent of marriages end in divorce? Anybody know? 50%. You're exactly right. Do you know a percent for Christian couples, their marriage end in divorce? 50%, the exact same thing. So here's the deal. Whether you're a Christian or not, here's your chance of your marriage ending in divorce. Just flip a coin. But I think we can do better than that. But as a matter of fact, the Southern Baptist Convention did some further research, and here's what they found. In their research that they did, they found out that, that couples that go to church together regularly and pray together daily have less than a 1% chance of their marriage ending in divorce. Yeah, yeah, that's something to clap for. The key is go to church together. In other words, you come here, you hear Pastor David sharing powerful messages that are going to impact your life that you can go use in your day-to-day -day life. But beyond that, when you find yourself every single day praying to God, something happens. I like to say it this way, that, that those that are willing to put everything in their life in God's hands will see God's hands in every part of their life. Let, let me say that again. If you're willing to give everything, put everything in your life in God's hands, you will see God's hand in every part of your life. And so that's what happens when, as a couple, you say, you know what, we're going to go to God and pray. So all that stuff that you're holding on to, this thing that you think your, your friend's husband treats her better than your husband does you, you begin to take those things to God. That, that frustration that you had, you begin to take those things to God. All the hurt that you have from another marriage and another relationship, you begin to take those things to God. The depression and anxiety that you had, you begin to take those things to God. And it's amazing what happens when every single day you say, you know what, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to give these things to you and thank you in advance and show me your favor today. The second thing, if you're taking notes, you can write this down is this, is you need to open your heart. Everybody say open. This is going to spell fog, by the way. The F was focused. The O is open. Open your heart. Verse 29. Here's what the scripture says. Confused and disturbed, 
Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. Here's the deal. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. I I encourage you to go read this text in the message version because the message version with this text just keeps it real. As a matter of fact, the message version says that Mary was shook. You know what I'm saying? Like straight up. Like I I can't make this stuff up. It says that Mary was shook. I mean, you think about it, this situation. Mary's like, man, you tripping. This dude come here talking about I'm about to be pregnant. Who's this dude named Gabe? Is that your cousin? You better get Gabe. He come up here talking crazy to me. Dude talking about I'm about to be pregnant. Don't he know I'm a virgin? Don't he know I'm engaged to be married to Joseph? Joseph, his homeboys, them are going to be tripping. They're going to be calling him all out. And my girl's over there saying I'm out here and saying I'm ratchet. I ain't done nothing with nobody. I've been faithful to my man. This dude tripping talking about I'm praying talking about I'm gonna have somebody that's gonna be the son of the most high he must be the most high because I ain't doing nothing he must be smoking the stinky weed I don't know what he's talking about dude this dude done lost his mind you better get your homeboy Gabe you gotta understand she was 16 so she was coming at him just like this after Mary finished going off Gabriel simply said God's plan. God's plan. <laughs> Mary was like, Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wish and wish and wish and wish and they wish on me. Yeah. Hey, hey. See what y'all be listening to for worship music all during the week. (laughs) The band can come on out. Let's just finish that up. But Mary's like, seriously, why are you wishing all these bad things on me? Like, you're tripping. But you got to think about it. We're talking about open your heart, being open to what God would have for you. This is not something that Mary should be open to. Like, dude, you're tripping. What do you mean? I'm supposed to be pregnant and give birth to a son. Like, what are you talking about? But she had to be willing to open her heart. And that's my challenge for you tonight. You've got to be willing to open your heart to what God would have for you. And as couples, you've got to be willing to open your heart to what God would speak to you about your spouse. I remember my wife and I first got married. We'll be married 17 years this August. We've been, we've been rocking together for about 20-something, been married 17. And I'm just going to help some of you guys out right now. Some of you guys are trying to do the math. Maybe you weren't here the last time I spoke. Yes, we've been married 17 years, been together 20-something. Our oldest son is Scott Wesley Williams Jr., and he was in our wedding. I'm just saying, like, let me just, yeah, I'm just saying, like, he was, I, I told you, when he became a preacher's kid a little later, I'm like, Dad, how did that happen? Here's the deal. You were so good, God gave you to us early. You know what I'm saying? So, but anyway, so, but, uh, but I'm sitting there thinking about when we first got married, like, I'm a 10 to 0 extrovert, and my wife is a 10 to 0 introvert, which means, like, when we were having arguments early on, like, I'd be like, no, we need to talk about it. I follow her to the bedroom. No, we need to talk about it now. And, and over time, I just realized if I will give her her introvert space, allow her to go do her thing for a few minutes, and then we come and talk about it later on, we'll be fine. And some of you fellows, that's, you need to know how your wife is wired. Make sure you read five love languages. Make sure you do the things that are going to make sure that you can focus and know who your spouse is. And what I also like to tell couples is this, is that when, when, you're, when you're trying to run after God and you're opening your heart and you want your marriage and your relationship to be amazing, Quit running towards one another. What I like to say is look at it like a pyramid. And God is up here. You're on both sides of this pyramid. As you guys run towards God, guess what? You will get closer and closer and closer and closer together. Make sure you're running towards God. Don't worry about running towards one another. He'll take care of the rest. And so we're talking about opening your heart. We're opening your heart to some things that you might not have normally seen, some things that you might not have expected God to show you. And some of you guys, some of you ladies, like you've been searching for God's best and praying for God to send you Mr. Right. But you're not willing to open your heart. And you know what? He keeps sending you Mr. Right, but you don't want to date him because he looks like a nerd right now. (laughs) 
And some of you laugh, but that's what God, like you need to be willing to open your heart. Fellas, the same thing. Like every single Saturday night, you're going to the club trying to find Mrs. Right. It ain't going to happen. You know what I'm saying? But you got to be willing to open your heart to what God would speak to you, how God would be able to use you, how God would be able to reveal himself in these various relationships. Because I don't care what it is that you're dealing with. Like God has something amazing that he wants to put in your relationship. God has something amazing he wants to put in your life, in your situation. But if, if your hands are not open, you can't receive it. So you have to open your hands, and then secondly, you have to open your heart. And when you do it, God's going to speak some things to you that are uncomfortable, they're awkward. Like I said, Mary was, was disturbed and didn't know what was going on. But you got to know it's God, and you got to be willing to open up to see what God has for you. I'm telling you, like, you're, you're a couple of decisions away from God giving you something major. And some of you, you know, like you're sitting here right now and you've been frustrated coming to this series. They're going to talk about relationships. I'm sick and tired. You got girlfriends that are, that are, you know, showing all their pictures on Instagram of their vacation with their new boo. And you're like, man, she out there. How'd she get him? And I'm just sitting here. I'm just trying to honor God. But you got to be willing to open your heart. And, and you got to change your focus. Focus your eyes and open your heart. And what we're talking about is you got to be willing to get right. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll get right, you won't have to swipe right. What's key is like the conceive and give birth. That means there's a process. Like we want to get to the end, but we don't want to go through the process. We don't want to trust the process. We want to get to the end. And, and, and young people, you want what your parents have right now. You don't want to go through the process. Some of you, you, you got some folks you follow on social media. You want the success that they have now, but you don't want to go through the process. Some of you, you want that amazing marriage, but you don't want to go through the process. And I love that the scripture says conceive and give birth. What that means is that God is going to have to put something in you. He has to give something to you. And it's a process to get to where the birth is going to happen. But you've got to be willing to be open to be able to receive what God is trying to show you that he wants you to conceive. And what you've got to understand is God's not going to give something to you that he's not going to see through you. But you've got to be willing to open your heart. Because the favor of God, I'm here to tell you, is you can't achieve it. You can only receive it. And the only way that you can receive it is if you open your hands and that you open your heart. Last thing for taking notes, here's the G. And this is where the, the band will come behind me and play behind me to make me sound more spiritual. Let's try this again. It's good. Need some symbols. Symbols just make it. There we go. <laughs> the G is this, is you need to go in faith. Everybody say go. go. Everybody say go. go. You got to go in faith. Verse 35. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age, and people used to say she was barren. What you know, people used to say that there's no way that you can find Mr. or Mrs. Right. People used to say that you're always going to be alone. People used to say because you got a divorce, you got a big D on your forehead. People used to say that you were always going to be an addict. People used to say that your marriage is always going to be hanging on by a thread. People used to say that there's no way that your wayward son or daughter is going to come to know the Lord. People used to say they're always going to date people that they know is not. God's best. But guess what? She has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. That's what you need to understand. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters what God says. And what does God say? Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. Let's say that one more time. For nothing is impossible with God. Verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you said to me come true. And then the angel left her. And so we're talking about go in faith. In other words, we're talking about you got to do something. You got to move. It's one thing to come in here and hear a, a cute message about focusing your eyes and opening your heart. It's another thing for you to do the hard work and say, you know what? I'm going to change. I'm going to go in faith because, you know, they, they tell us that, that the game of, of football is a game of inches. I, I tend to believe that life 
is a game of inches. As a matter of fact, could you throw that pic of my, my car back up there, the accident we had? When we had the accident, I, I remember talking to the highway patrol and the, the record driver when he was coming to pick up my vehicle. He said, Mr. Williams, we, we, we see situations like this all the time. And with a car going as fast as that car was going and how fast your car was going, when you got flying objects, it's normally catastrophic. And so if you look at the, the picture there, if you look at the one on the left, if you see my car there on the left, what you'll see is like you see that big gash in my hood and you see that arrow pointing up. And right above that is my steering wheel. He said, Mr. Williams, if, if that pole would have been six inches higher on your side, you would have been dead. And if you look at the other image where, where that glass is crashed at the top, that's where the glass hit on my wife's side and glass fell all in her lap. And he said, you know, on your wife's side, if that would have been six inches lower, she would have been dead. And so it reminds to me at that moment that, that life truly is a game of inches. And it's not about just being a game of inches in that situation. It's about a game of inches in everything that we do. And what's important to know, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have flying objects that are going to come at your relationships. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have flying objects going to come at your marriage. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have flying objects going to come at your kids. But what it means, if you're willing to focus your eyes, you're willing to open your heart, and you're willing to trust God and go in faith, what he's saying is he's going to protect you. There's some things that he's going to do in your life. There's some doors that he's going to open in your life. There's this illustration that God just gave me with this. You know, when you get ready to go into a store and those stores have those, those, those doors that are, that are motion activated. In other words, you go to the door and when you're in the motion, what happens? The door it opens up. But guess what? So when you're in God's motion, the door opens up. But some of you, you're wondering why you're not seeing doors opening in your life. And I'm here to tell you the reason why. It's because you're outside of God's motion. And so when you get outside of God's motion, the doors are not going to open up. When you get outside of God's motion, you're going to experience a lot of commotion. And so some of you want to know why you're experiencing a commotion in your life. I'm here to tell you today. I came a thousand miles to tell you. It's because you're outside of God's motion. And we're talking about a game of inches. Today, the day that you're going to make some steps. You're going to take some steps to the right. You're going to take some steps to the right. You're going to take some steps to the right. And you're going to begin to take the steps that God wants you to take. And when you do, it's a game of inches. You're going to see doors start to open. You're going to see blessings start to happen. You're going to see breakthroughs start to happen. Here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to know if there's some people here today that want to find favor in their life. Are there some favor finders in this room tonight? Do you want to experience God's favor in your life? Come on, are there some favor finders? Is there, is there, is there a rough area in your life? Is your marriage hanging on by a thread? Do you got a son or daughter that you know is not experiencing God's best? Are you addicted to pornography and bringing that into your relationship? But you say, God, I want to find your favor today. I want to walk in the fullness and favor of God. And people say, well, Pastor Scott, you're just a cup half full type of guy. No, I'm a cup all the way full type of guy because here's what I know. If my cup is all the way full, what's flowing into me can overflow. And even my old cousin Elizabeth that's got some crazy situation and some crazy problems, she can experience the blessing and breakthrough that God would have for you. Some of you are that Elizabeth and God has something for you. You keep coming through these doors, you're going to experience the favor of God that's on your pastors. You're going to experience the favor of God that's on this house. And many of you are just inches away. Inches away from blessing. Ma'am, inches away from breakthrough. Wipe those tears away. God's got something special for you inches away in the back. Sir, inches away. Generation, sir, in the back, I see you inches away. Doors are about to open. Doors are about to open. But you got to do your part. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But I just want to remind you, the next time you have a, a rough day, the next time you're experiencing a rough situation, the next time you feel like that nobody has the relationship problems and the past history and the, the damage that's happened to them and the abuse that's happened to them, I want you to think about being Mary for a minute. What do you think Mary's situation was? All of her homegirls was hating on her. Everybody was hating on her. Oh, really, girl, you was out there. You ain't got pregnant by God. Really, this ain't the Son of God. It wasn't until the resurrection that everybody be able to understand what Mary really was carrying. And many of you got to understand, you got to go through something in order to get to something. And here's the deal. You got to step out in order to find out. And that's what you're going to do for the first time today. Many of you say, you know what, God? I came in here carrying some stuff. And today's the day I want to walk out and I want to see burdens lifted. I want to walk in the full and the fullness and the favor of God. And I'm telling you, that's why God sent me here, just to give you that one word. 
I got something for you. I need, I need you to go in faith. I need you to believe it, sir. I need you to believe that God is really going to do something in your relationship. I need you to believe that, that God has something better for you when you decide to, to not, not to shack up and decide to honor your relationship through marriage. I got something for you if you're willing to run after your son or daughter because you've given up on them because they're out there doing the wrong things. And when you do your part, when you go in faith, I'm telling you, man, the favor of God is going to be so heavy on your life that you're not even going to know what to do. I'm telling you, they said you was barren. They said you had no chance. They said there's no way things could be different because you're going to walk out these doors confident today and know the enemy is going to whisper some negativity in your ear. That's all he can do. You're going to block him out. The haters are going to say, you need to try something different. You can't worry about what the haters say. I mean, the haters are the ones that will see Jesus walking on water say, he's just walking on water because he can't swim. We could care less what the haters say. We care about what God says. And what God says is this, there is nothing that's impossible with God. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. If you want to experience favor in your life, just all across this room, just raise your hands. I just want to pray over you right now. God, I pray for every single hand that's raised right now. God, I don't know the details of everything that's represented in this room, but God, I know that you do, God. I pray right now for those that are carrying some heavy burdens, God, as they open their heart, Lord, would those burdens be lifted, God. I pray for that those that came in this room tonight with lots of questions, God, they walk out these doors tonight with lots of answers, God. God, I pray for, for marriages that were hanging on by a thread that you begin to mend them instantly, God. I pray for those that have addictions, that those addictions begin to be lifted right now, God. I pray for those that are looking for Mr. and Mrs. Right, that you would show them who they are, that you would reveal them, God. I pray that there's people that, that can't get to their cars tonight without you showing them your favor, God. I pray there's people that can't get through this week without you showing their favor, God. I pray for these new graduates, God, that you would show favor not only in their life in the media, but in their future, God. I pray for future spouses right now. I pray for world changers, God. I pray for generational curses that are being lifted right now, God. God, I see it right now. I see hands that are waved, God. I see people, I see things that are breaking right now. And it's not about anything that we do because here's what we know about the favor of God. It's nothing that we can achieve. We can only receive. May your people receive it. May they be prepared for it. And may they step in it. We love you and we thank you. And all God's children said, Amen.